It is Monday, December 18th, 2023. The Board of Commissioners of the Hardwick Electric Department is meeting on Zoom uh, due to the weather um, and the potential for flooding. Uh, it is 4.03 p.m. All, uh, no, not all members. Um, commissioners Ambrosino, Prevo, Smith, and Gedankin are present, as is Mike Sullivan, Beth Essery, Ken Nolan, and we have, and um, Eric Remick is here. And it looks like Steve Farman is joining. So um, the first item on the agenda is um, are there any modifications to the agenda? Ezra, we just got to stop it, kiddo. We just got to stop. Um, hearing none, uh, the agenda is approved. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the meeting of November 20th? No move. Is Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Say aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. Uh, the motion passes. So the minutes are approved. And could we please get these posted right away along with all the other minutes that haven't been posted? Um, the next item on the agenda is public comment. Um, Eric, is there anything that you would like to say? Um, sure. Uh, well, yeah, if it's if now is an appropriate time, I have now uh, is, is is an appropriate time. Uh, yellow barn questions, um, Mike. Thank you for that updated cost estimate. I just barely saw that. Um, so that's for the system upgrade. And did you also send the cost estimate for the um, power connection, the service on site? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I believe Brian and Karen already sent that out and I think it oh. in, increased by $7,000, something like that. Do you know where that is that? Did that go out today? Boy, I, Karen's not here today. I thought it went out Thursday. Oh, I must've missed it. But I can, that's uh, in the file. I can print it and give you a copy tomorrow. Yeah, if you could send it electronically, that'd be even better. Yeah, I can do that. Because I haven't haven't seen that. So maybe it went to somebody else or maybe I missed it. So it was it was almost the exact same cost. The only difference is gonna be the install to the existing riser and the teardown of the existing riser labor cost was most of the difference. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, I think, but I think Eric, overall, the those costs will be reduced because of the reduced primary underground run and the reduced section that has to be the reduced section of primary underground conduit cable and concrete encasing. I think is going to save you significantly on the power run itself overall. Yeah, I think you're I think you're probably right on that. So we have to pay for the but we'll still have to pay for the build and the tear down to that riser pole. Well, we already built it and we didn't get paid for that yet. And yes, we're gonna have costs associated with tearing it out and changing the plan. Yes. Okay. So we'll have to see on balance. I mean, I guess that pole um what we heard from our wetlands uh consultant of that poll can't stay there without a permit amendment anyway. Um, so I guess that kind of pushes the issue. The only other way to do it, the original plan would be to move that poll over a little bit towards Route 15, which could also work, I guess. I don't know. We'll have to look. But you prefer the the proposed coming uh, with a new a new route across the road. Absolutely, um, best choice. Yep. Okay. Um, can I ask? So I just, I literally just barely saw the system upgrade email, like as I was logging in. 
but um, is it okay to ask a couple questions about that? Sure. All right. So, um, uh, will there also be additional consolidated fees? Consolidated costs are nothing to do with us, and they're on top of us. And and is there a way to just avoid those? Can they stay on the old poles? To I mean, I don't know. Is there some other solution there? Uh, if you wanted to give them a waiver of removing the old poles, I'm sure they'd be happy to stay on them, and you have double wood all through town. Well, I, I don't even know where this is. I, I don't know where we're talking about. I don't know the implications of that. I'm just throwing it out there. Well, the power line that runs down Wolcott Street goes up Granite Street and continues on over to the substation. That's the line that has to be upgraded. Okay. So every pole that they are on, that we are on, a new pole will be set and they will have charges to transfer their stuff onto the new pole, including all the customer connections onto the new poles, et cetera. And then they have to remove the old poles. So all those costs. And I don't think any of those costs will change from the numbers that I believe Andrew worked up for you previously. Okay. And then um, uh, it seems. Pardon me, Travis. Travis Andrews is the guy's name. Okay. Um, I th yeah, I think I have that somewhere. If I can't find it, I'll ask you again. Yeah. And um, so the interest cost seems quite large. Um. just wondering yeah so that was based on the new split of costs and our 91.5 percent being financed uh -huh. at a rate of five and a half percent and i have a little spreadsheet that actually steve farman put together i could send along to you oh you great you can play with and it. is that um and the amount that's being financed is it roughly two million plus two million yeah 1.85 somewhere right around there Oh, I thought when we last in the November meeting, I thought you said if we got under the 500 KVA uh, request, the, it made it made the upgrade quite a bit smaller because you didn't have to upgrade the substation. It does make the upgrade smaller and it reduced your costs by over $200,000, but it doesn't change the fact that we still have to do the upgrade. The split in those costs is just you're going from 20% to eight and a half percent of the cost. And we're going from 80 to 91 and a half percent of the cost. The cost. Oh, is the same. I must've misunderstood. I thought last month you said that the, the upgrade got substantially smaller as well. No, I said, if you got to 300 or less, then the upgrades would be substantially smaller at 425. We still have to do the same upgrades. Oh, I thought I had misunderstood. I thought you said getting under 500 made it so that the substation didn't need to be up, upgraded. That's no. what I heard last month. No, no, you you didn't hear that, Eric. That was 300. I I remember just because I was really zoomed in on what do we have to do to make the okay. go away. I thought if we got under three, yeah, yeah. Th then that I thought if we got under 300, then the upgrade went away entirely. Yes, correct. But I thought. It's okay. not that the upgrade was smaller. It's that your piece of the upgrade above 300. Uh, okay. So the full up. I Okay. So this thing about 500, there wasn't uh, something no about 500. 500. Yeah. No, I don't remember 500. No. On, on the interest cost, I'm just trying to get my, to uh, make sure I fully understand. Bribery will get you everywhere with a dog. Um. So this interest cost is is the acceleration for three years of it's 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 the incremental cost of paying the interest three years earlier. Steve, can you handle that one? You're muted. I can't hear you, Steve. Always gets me on the first one. <laughs> um, it's been a while since I put that spreadsheet together, Mike. Um, 
yeah, but if just I, the philosophy of it. Yeah, the idea was that you're you're going to be incurring interest and carrying it for, I don't know, was it two or three years? It was some three period. Years, three years early, yeah. Earlier than otherwise. So the idea was you shouldn't have to pay that interest. That you shouldn't have to pay the interest at all or that you shouldn't? Well, I think. Is, is, I guess what I'm asking is, is the interest, it would seem to me the interest cost would be the cost of accelerating would be the difference between the NPV of doing it when we were going to do it and the NPV of doing it earlier. And I think that's... And then it would be whatever... And then it would be whatever their piece of that... Yes. ...cost is. I and is that what the calculation did. was? I believe so. I don't have it in front of me, and I'm trying to remember. I think that's what we did, is we looked at the present value at the difference due to the timing... And I don't remember if if I just calculated it 100 percent. I'm not sure we knew um, what the split was going to be at that point in time. Right. And all we did look. is look at the it was a 20 year uh, note. And I think you showed the first five years. And I said, yeah, we only need the first three of the five. And that's what I used. What uh, yeah. I don't understand that. What do you mean you only need the first three of the five? Steve had displayed more of the years than what was necessary from what the department said the town should contribute to the interest costs. Can, can, but it's not the interest cost for three years. It should be the difference in PV. It's the cost of accelerating the interest cost, isn't it? Which would be less than the interest cost. It's the cost of borrowing money three years early. Which is the NPV. It's the di or it's I believe at least it was the three years worth of interest and the NPV of that was the was the delta that we worked with. But it shouldn't be but you have to pay the three years of interest. You're just paying it now or later. The cost of borrowing three years earlier is the difference in, in the net present values of the two streams of payments. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like bar borrowing it three years okay. earlier doesn't, doesn't add three that's, years that's, of interest. That's, that's great, but... Um, I mean, I you know, I don't know what was... I'm just asking philosophically what... what it, what I think it should be and what you're saying is right. And I, and I think that's what we did, but that was months ago and I don't have it in front of me, so I won't guarantee you anything at this point, but I believe that's what we did. And that's why, like Mike said, I gave him a much longer time frame. I think we rolled the whole thing out for, for 20 years or. Okay. And what was the discount? Whatever we thought the length of the bond was going to be. And what was the discount rate that was used to calculate the remember. NPV? Probably 5% or something like that. But I don't remember. And I don't have it where I can lay my hands on it real okay. quick. It may, it may, given that it was done a long time ago, it might be worth just revisiting the calculation to make sure that it's correct. And also, I don't know when the money is going to be borrowed, but the reports that I was hearing is that the Fed's expecting to reduce rates. In 2024, when, yeah, and, and we don't know the run that about. the run that Steve did several months ago for us was, I believe, at six percent, and we've been looking at loan rates just over five percent with our discussions with the local banks. So I ran it at five point five today, just for some cushion. So, and, and if um, there's money. What? You know, if, if we ended up, uh, the estimate was $500 over what we actually incur in costs, the $500 do go back to the town. We, we only charge the actual dollars we incur. Right, but if we're, if we're paying 5%. More bribery. If we're paying five and a half percent and we're discounting it back at five percent, 
then essentially you've got a half a percent rate. I mean, I'm just trying to do a, a back of the envelope in, the, in my head, right? I'm not sure they were discounting it. I think it was just no, the out-of-pocket. That's cash across cost the cost we incur interest. because the town is forcing us to do our project three years early. But we're going to be paying three years less interest at the end of the note. We're not paying three more years of interest. We're paying, we're paying the end, which is why I think you need to look at the whole stream and the difference in the stream. We can well, first of all. Yeah, not a problem. I had another question about how it worked, Lynn, which was if to the extent that other um, customers come into the picture during that three year period, does that lessen the burden of the town with respect to the interest? Do they? So if somebody start if, the clock, if somebody, Joe customer, uh, wanted to build right next to the yellow barn, a mirror picture of the yellow barn uh, within X number of years. And that drops off uh, in chunks of three years, five years, seven years. But if they came in three days later, built the exact same project, they would have to reimburse the town for 50% of all the costs they incurred. And, and include, we'd apply that to the interest. Sure, yeah. So that's one way. And then we don't know exactly what we're going to borrow at. Right. And so hopefully we can find a source. And so if we, it's whatever we really pay in interest. But it still has to be the PV of it. It still has to be, it still, because you're going to pay, it's going to be a 20 year note. Leaving aside the town's piece of it. I'm not, I'm not believe me, I, 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 I don't want HED's customers to bear any more cost than they should be bearing. But I'm just, from an analytic standpoint, if we're borrowing for tw 20 years to do this upgrade, the difference in cost to us today of borrowing, starting that borrowing three years earlier than we would otherwise have is the net present value in the stream of interest payments over the life of the note. But there's no principal payment, there's just interest. And it's a, it, because of the early triggering, wouldn't it be that it'd be the full amount of the interest because- It would be the we, full amount, it, would, it wouldn't just be the interest, it would be the full payment. It would be the stream of payment. But that's not, that's no, what's only, what we were, it's only that's, the cost of borrowing the money. No, but the so cost- that, the so cost. let me and Steve and Eli circle back and yeah. give you okay. all a statement about this. But the I cost of doing it right. I think the cost of borrowing the money early is the, is is the NPV of the difference in the two payment streams, and that includes principal yeah. and interest. That doesn't how that is. That's it. a possible way to do it, but it doesn't sound like that's what the guideline was. But yeah. So, Mike, when you provide the 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 workup on it, can you provide the guide guidance? Sure. Whatever the guidance document sure. with, that'll that'll, that that'll would, help us make sense of it. Yeah. So this is what we got from DPS. Yes. Okay. Well, let's see what we got. The from guidance that. we got from the DPS, we I had basically Steve and Eli tell me what it said. So I didn't. I would like to up. see, and I think Roger. I think we'd all yeah. like to see and make yep. our own. Not a problem. What it says. It's just so big, yeah. But I know that if you're looking at the cost of alternative investments and doing investments at different times, if we were looking at that analysis for ourselves, having nothing to do with the town we would look at the NPV, not of the interest payments, but of the whole stream of costs. But it would be the NPV, with... not interest payments for the, right. the years in full. Anyway, probably enough said. We we need to see, yeah. see that.
Okay. So, so how did we do on that? I guess from from your comments, Eric, you're sort of feeling like, oh, we a lot of work was done. Some of the costs came down. We scored that as a success. Then the interest went up a little and didn't go down a lot. So net net, you still have a big bill. It's just not as big. But the problem is it's big. <laughs> is that yeah. is that what we're reading? So it, it, yeah. So in Mike's email this afternoon, the bottom line is that the cost decreased. The project cost decreased from six hundred eighty-two thousand seven hundred fifty-four dollars to four hundred sixty-seven thousand three hundred twenty-six dollars. So it's still nearly half a million dollars of unbudgeted expense for the project. And that's so, a problem. So it's still a problem. Um, yeah. But the um, the sooner that, that we are firm on this number, I guess the sooner we can start beating the bushes for grant funds, which is what's going to have to happen because we don't yeah. have another way. And I, I have started to reach out to our usual suspects for getting money. And um, I don't know yet where we're going to go for money for this because we've been to most of the wells. Um, but it's just, it's just the last in the string of problems for this project. So I hope is the last one. Hope the flood doesn't wash it away tonight. Mm. Got it. So if anybody has a line on half a million bucks, let me know. <laughs> okay. Any anything else, Eric, that you no. want to write? Got one more. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a finger. Yeah, I just had a thought. It probably doesn't probably doesn't work. I was thinking of the USDA Red Leg program where you can that's a loan program, but zero percent interest. Anyway. That's, that's a pretty good loan. It is. Yeah, it's for economic development. It runs through utilities. Uh we've talked about it in the past. Um and yeah, I don't know, but I don't, maybe it's not a great fit and it's also a loan and really we don't have the means. Yeah, I need to look for a grant. But I wouldn't. Well, if, uh, there's, if there, well, but if there is a loan, if the issue in fact is interest, on, is first three years of interest and not the PV of the payment stream, the difference in payment streams, then a zero percent interest bucks. would have would have zero cost. And yes, but I don't think that that program that's a program that's for economic development or business development that's funneled through a utility. I don't think it can be used directly for the utility. Um, you know what the utility right. is doing is for economic development. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I, okay. So at some point, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to meet up with USDA folks and, and see, but what, what they have to offer, because it would be really great if we could find a better loan vehicle for HED, it'd be better for everyone. Yeah. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is a plan 2% rate increase, the schedule and process with Steve. The floor is yours. Okay. Um, I sent a package to Mike. I don't know, was that shared, Mike? Yes. And depending on how much time anybody's had to look at it, will probably influence well, what depth we go into here. It's, um, it wasn't in the hard copy of the packet, was it? No. It was a separate email. Okay. Well, let's see. I need to share my screen then, don't I? Yeah, you're in there. Mm, share screen. 
See how smart I am. I think it's this one. Share. Do you guys see yes. a couple of documents? Okay. I'll put these side by side like this. Um, are they big enough to read? Do I need to make them bigger? They're plenty big to read from my screen, but I can't speak for others. Okay. I'll leave them <laughs> side by side. And it's, they have, yeah, what was that thing, Nat? That? What's Jack, that? Jack, is Jack that? Is glass. Is that the Nat Smith Hubble telescope? Yep. That's it. <laughs> yeah, I can read it. <laughs> nice. So the first the first page of that document I sent, this one here, it won't highlight for me. So okay. Um this is kind of like think of it sort of as a as an agenda. This is covers the pieces of what has to be filed in a 218DN 2% 2 filing. Um, the other document on the screen is the actual mm -hmm. procedure and criteria that the um, commission approved that you have to follow to, to do one of these filings. Um, the filing itself and what's, what's in the document, if and when you get a chance to look at it, if you haven't, is actually the entire filing that we used for Enosburg in 2022. So the whole thing is there. I just put the whole thing in that document thinking that would be useful to glance through. It looks like a long document. All the tariffs are at the bottom. So that adds to the bulk, but doesn't really, it's not something we need to wade through tonight in any detail. But this left, this left hand document, the actual filing, you have to file a cover letter. And in the cover letter, basically, you you tick all the boxes that show up in the um, the criteria. I should probably just go through the criteria first. This would be, let me just do this. Yeah. So to file one of these, you have to have had a rate increase within the last 10 years, a full rate increase. That's covered for you guys. And then there's some more criteria. The percentage rate is applied equally to all customers. It's the same proportional um, requirement that you have in a normal rate case. You can't change one class more than another. Can't be more than 2% in a 12 month period. So you couldn't implement this 2% rate increase until, I don't remember, is it March or April that we were, the effective date was on the last one, Mike? It's March, wasn't it? March, March I believe, yep. So you have to get beyond that. And then over time, it doesn't really affect this one, but you you can't have more than 10% worth of these 2%. And they don't have to be 2%. You could do 10 1%s or a combination of different sizes as long as you don't cumulatively exceed 10%. Um, if you try to go, go beyond 10%, you have to then do a full rate case. And the proposed rate change has to have been approved by the utilities governing body. And we have to show documentation in the filing. With Enosburg, we just took the, there was a resolution. We, we pulled the minutes from the meeting or that section of the minutes and provided that and that was sufficient. So you have to, you have to still allow for a 45 day wait period notice period, whatever you want to call it. And you have to provide a written notice of the rate change to all the customers that covers filing date, effective date, percentage of the rate change, and instructions how you can contact the utility, PC, DPS. Um, that's all the stuff that's normally taken care of in a rate case notice. Um, in a minute, we'll get a lot I've got an example a little further down. You'll see that the notice we used for Enosburg was quite a lot simpler than the normal notice. And it doesn't have all the individual rates in it. It's a little, it's a little more efficient. Um, so then there's, there is still analysis that you have to do. Number two here, 
Um, when you when you file this thing, we have to provide some sort of a rate analysis, financial analysis that demonstrates the need for the rate change. We've got to describe the major drivers. Um, in Enosburg's case, we kept it pretty simple. And we basically said that power costs, market, market energy costs, and uh, transmission by others were the culprit. Basically, um, you still have to look at your power supply and all your costs. I put together a cost of service schedule that looks much like the normal, more complicated one. There's just less work and detail underneath. Um, so description of the drivers, a description of how the rate change meets the eligibility criteria above. I'll, I'll go through that section in the in the Enosburg filing in a second. I think it'll be easier than trying to describe it here. Um, documentation showing that you have approval for the rate change from the governing body. And all the tariff sheets have to be included. And what's what's the one thing? Well, the one thing I didn't mention, um, there's a schedule that has the current and proposed rates, revenues. And it, that's exactly the same as we file in a normal case. It just has all your tariffs, the kilowatts, kilowatt hours, customer charge, before and after the rate increase. Um, and then from a regulatory review perspective, the department has 30 days to file a recommendation. In theory, they could still file a recommendation that says that the commission should investigate. Um, they haven't been doing that. There's only been a few of these. Um, I don't think they have much interest in doing that, to tell you the truth. They're busy too, but it is a possibility. If we don't file something stupid, it shouldn't really be an issue. Um, DPS, the commission can ask for additional information. Yes, they can do discovery. Um, in Enosburg's case, we had no discovery, but it's possible. So unless the DPS files an objection, which would lead the PUC to order an investigation within 45 days, the rates go into effect. So Steve, besides Enosburg, I know there's a few of us considering pulling the trigger on these, and I we are. We are doing it. Um, has anybody besides Enos Berg completed this process? Yeah, I think BEC did one. Okay. I think it might be you, Enos Berg and BEC might be the only two to this point. Okay. There, I mean, yeah, there are other people looking at doing it. I can think of several of our members that, haven't told me that yet, but I, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see a few line up behind you. Yeah. Over the next few months. And in the end, the PUC will issue an order. I think we got our order for Enosburg on about day 43. Um, but we had had no discovery. I mean, it went smooth, went through slicker than a bean. Um, no guarantees. One thing we're going to have to watch out for, um, because you do still have to file a, a cost of service. We, we based we based the pro forma for Enosburg on their budget, on the power supply components of their budget, and basically made very few no very few other adjustments to any other O and M costs. Um, that may or may not be the case with you. So we still have to look at the numbers and decide how to approach it. Yeah. Um, and in Enosburg's case, they had to throw in the use of a big chunk of ARPA money that they had because the way their numbers fit together, it looked like they really should be filing for a lot more than 2%, and John didn't want to. Um, so we found a way to work a credit into the cost of service so that it, it came out to about 2%. Um, the, I mean, the danger there is if you, if, you file number, if you file numbers that say, oh, we need 10 or 12%, but we're only going to ask for two, you know what's going to happen. The department is going to say, hey, you're not asking for enough. I think we better open an investigation. So it's to some extent, it's how you frame it and, and how you 
how you present it, depending on exactly, you know, what your, how your numbers work out. So that's, I'm going to switch over. I'm smart enough to my other. Other, come on. We'll just make this double screen. There we go. Um, kind of covered this part way. The filing has to include a cover a cover letter, and we and we we stru You'll see in a minute. We structured the cover letter so it basically follows through the requirements from that commission document. So you get a cover letter. Um, the couple of exhibits that we use to substantiate cost of service, <clears throat> um, the rates and revenues. I think we had four exhibits in total there. Fairly simple. Um, the cover letter will refer to those. Yeah, and then, then you have your cost of service schedule. Then I would guess, you know, there'll be some power costs, there'll be some transmission by others. And whether we talk about labor depreciation, kind of depends on how we're trying to frame things. That kind of remains to be seen. The current and proposed rates, we've talked about that. Documentation of the commission's approval, customer notice, and then tariff sheets. So those are all the pieces that go into the filing. And, okay, why? Where's the rest of it? It was in the packet that was sent. There it is. Yeah, no, my confusion is I have, these are a, a, a handful of individual documents at my end, but I put them all into one zip archive and I've got a combination of the two here that confused me. So, so is the, this is, go ahead. No, uh, is, the, is, the, is the big difference between this, this doing the 2% route rather than going in for more is is that because we just had we don't have to do pre-file testimony and all of that kind of thing or a full-blown cost of service yeah you you don't you don't get wound up in the um the known and measurable versus projected quite so much think of it as it's it's not that different from a real rate case but the it's like a very relaxed standard in terms of documentation okay I, I would describe um, and, it and also it it kind of changes the perspective of the of the DPS in particular. Yeah. Where when you're filing a regular regular rate case, they have an affirmative need to react to it. And when you're filing this, it's okay. presumed to be approved unless they raise a complaint. So it it changes the way they look at it as well. But if when the analysis is actually done on cost of service, if it looks like we need a 7% increase, I mean, the, I would think we would file for a 7% increase and not go the 2% route thinking, because we'd just be digging ourselves a hole. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Our, I mean, that's our, a possibility. And we, our numbers may <clears throat> land there, but right now our numbers with the financing we were considering for the system upgrades, had us like just over 4% and 2% of that 4% was the financing itself. So yeah. our numbers are 2% uh, based on the last chopping that me and uh, Beth and Steve did. Is there any aspect of that um, calculation that led that supported the 2%? Is there any aspect of it that's has the most potential variability to be different. You know, in, in other words, by the time somebody might contest it, that it might get a little shaky. I Anything? don't think so. I believe they were uh, known labor cost increases, known uh, healthcare premium increases. It was definite Good. stuff nailed down, nailed down, you know, so it's not gonna change. 
And so for known, Sal, did you use the like the union contract pre-committed increase amount? Yep. And then for non-union people, did did you use what'd you use for that? For the staff, I use the same percentage because we historically try and do them equally. But you had in for the union what seven and a half percent? Mm. Would you have in for an increase? No, it was the five percent that we just did. Oh, okay. And Beth so and it's I basically five percent across the board. Yeah. Okay. So that's and and purchase power. Do they really do they mess around with you the way this you know the market can change a little up, a little down? Are they gonna get in your underwear for that? Which which kind of filing are you talking about? The the two percent. Two percent. Yeah, this two percent. Yeah, they probably won't. I mean, right now okay. the market is, you know, fairly low and fairly stable. Right. I, mean, I guess that could change by the time we file this in the in the spring or late winter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, well, but if no, you're asking, if you're asking for two percent, there's just not much room for them to bother. Good. Good. Okay. Um, you right. know, basically, you can say, "Hey, my transmission by others' costs are going up because Southern New England keeps improving the transmission system." And yeah. that covers your two percent right yeah, there. There's two percent right there. Yep. I mean, right. you, you almost would want to be more worried about if the number comes out much higher than two percent. Then you got to scratch your head and go, um, now how can I do? file for the two percent if I really need seven, like Len said? Yep. Um, you you inconceivably could still decide to do that. It depends a little bit on your on your cash position, uh, what you think the timing of your next full rate increase is going to be, and you know a whole host of factors. It, it's you definitely need to think about it well the problem and, is that we haven't seen the budget yet but the budget for 24 without this two percent in it as early as we can get it it'll be a tough budget i imagine mike yes so we're kind of holding our breath every month we've been i think fortunate in recent months and hopefully that good fortune will continue for a bit yeah okay well i sure i sure support this enthusiastically because it's we got to get an increase or we probably will really struggle in 2024 and this seems like the clearest path so i i don't know lynn if we need to do we last time we voted to to authorize going forward seems like this has just been great it shows us what go forward means I, yes, I, that's, I mean, that, well, the, of... that was the intention is just so that yeah. you have an idea of what we what we have to complete to get there yeah yeah process. Well, i think you know i think we need to see the numbers because i i i you know we're not in a strong cash position um and you know, we've talked about some increased staffing at the last meeting, and and um, I th I think that that's something that's going to need to be discussed. Um, I don't know so how like much if the budget. If Mike and Beth brought a budget in and said, "Oh my gosh, now that we tallied everything up, if we don't get five percent, we're in deep trouble." That could change our course, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I I think I think we we're going to need a rate increase. The question is, can we can we do it with the two percent? And if that's the yeah. right number, that's great, because it's going to be a lot less grief for everybody. But if if we need more um, to do the things that we think we need to be doing, then then I think we need to go that route. Yeah, the problem will be, can we get with the way they do it? Can we? You know, can we create a case that'll get through? Because last time we created a case and only part of it got through. So, but it was still more than two percent. Yep, still more than two percent. But we had the ingredients to get there. So yeah. Well, I guess we'll know. What are the steps then? We do the budget work. We see what that looks like. We keep this rolling so that it's absolutely not a single day. We don't miss a single day of the opportunity. We sort of backward plan from the first date we could get it and do everything just that fast right yes yeah in theory you can you can get it into effect for for march 1st which means you've got to file it by january 15th 
we don't have a we'd have to have a special meeting well it also no we know, works do we have to vote way. again i guess we have to vote we should vote again on the detail even i don't think we, we can i don't think we can vote on this we don't have we don't have the information we don't have the cost of service we don't have the budget yeah no i mean you, what is it that we're voting on i think we should do a special meeting then because i think we're nuts if we if we go a day past the first eligible day to get it. I agree. Well, one of the things that leads you to is, is we've got to decide what you want to use for a test year. You still have well, to we, plant your feet on the ground and start from some actual cost basis. I think we, we, we trust your advice. You and Mike have got, and Beth have got to say, where, where are your numbers solid where there's enough? data to support it and your yeah. data is solid and and it's the most expedient that's kind of hard for us to judge the Even last i'm like lynn i love looking at it but i, I mean, we can't compare to you guys and knowing what's the right way to go yeah i think we're going to need two meetings if i understand the process correctly because we're going to need a meeting to look at stuff and then we're going to need a meeting to that's warned that we say in the warning that we are, that where there's an agenda item to approve and a 2% increase, or if that, if we're going that route. And so is, is, are we assuming, I know for our diligence, we, we would want to be more on top of all the details, but the minutes from the last meeting show that we did approve it. That's okay. So we'll, we'll have, November purchased power numbers probably the end of next week. And Ken, do you think it's reasonable for us to put a good estimate in for December that we could work with? Yeah, I think uh Heather's Heather's got the budget projected, so we can we can definitely give you something. Yeah, she and I have been trying to connect here for about a month, but the storms have been screwing us up. So can can we can that be shared with the commissioners, please? Absolutely. Um, but but again, going back, if I understood the procedure that Steve laid out, we have to specifically warn that that we are have an agenda item to approve a two percent increase. So even though we did that and we said Mike should implement that that doesn't count for this because it wasn't warned as part of the agenda. Let me that look at that agenda. Does anybody have that last agenda? I don't have the agenda, but I, it's certainly not in this agenda. No. Yeah, it said latest rate following number slash discussion. Yeah, that's not the same as saying that we're considering approving. Yeah. Yep. Right. I, I think you're right, Lynn. It needs to be specifically warned. And if we want yeah, to have it some discussion a key, before it's we a key do that, then I think the, we need two meetings. Okie dokie. Oh, oh. Easy, so my, easy enough by Zoom. Yes, yeah, Steve. We've got to pick a test here. Um, if you want to file by January 15th, I don't think you're going to be able to wait for 2023 actuals. Nope, for sure not. The lag um, time we have, yeah. Not, not without having a, it'd be pretty tight with a special meeting or two tucked in there. Yep. Um, so Beth's ability, your ability to put together 12 months ended something more recent than July. That's what we, we worked with 12 months ended July. And if um, it looked like the last it, analysis, if it looked like it worked, why don't you just stick with that? Good. We'd probably be smart to look at something more, more recent to make sure we're not missing something on the power supply side. So yeah. Steve, and, Steve and Beth and I will yeah, look at this stuff to. and propose a couple <clears throat> dates for a special meeting in January. If, if we're talking about a 2% increase, 
going in two weeks later is not going to be a huge revenue effect. I just I just note that. Yeah, I know, but yeah. you know how things go. It's better. I'm not I'm not suggesting yourself. that we slide it, but thinking about what Steve is saying about using more up to date data. Yeah, if it helps you. Yeah. You know, the, the so we that, have yeah, we, don't, we, well. we have October data. So yeah, we could add we could go three months three months. And and maybe that maybe those three months won't make much difference either. I, I'm not sure. I'm not I'm not that close to your numbers. Yeah, I'm looking but, at them trying to we know that with December's been so doggone warm. It's not like you're gonna have cold peak type effects. I'm I'm guessing that we're not going to see a uh, another mystic type thing at least in December. We're yeah we're not power supply, but we're going to see O and M costs for for December through the roof. Yeah, because of the the flood, the water, the storms. Oh, that the flood is the least of it from Storm. for us. Mm -hmm. We've had power outages every Monday this month. If it's Monday, it must be a major outage. <laughs> yeah so i mean that's we should factor that into our thinking whether we're going for two percent or something bigger um depending on what what walcott looks like and what kind of an effect that's having yeah so steve go well, take a look i'm i'm looking at slide 54 in our deck that has the power bill summary and the, the first half of the year, the first five months of the year where we were, we were underwater. And then the recent months we've been more favorable. So we'll be averaging in, we'll, but it might be counterproductive, but should you guys decide, just recognize it. The first half of the year was probably worse than the first, than the first right. three quarters of the year. Yeah, I, I see that with some of the other members too. Yeah. Um, so that's a that's a common story right now. So you might <laughs> if you think they're not gonna object to it, you might want to use the first half of the year. Yeah, and then there's yeah, I mean Mike and I will put our heads together, but there's there there's the question of is is there something coming that you know of in twenty twenty four? early well, 2024 that okay. I don't know about. Oh, you don't know. Well, you know, the analysis we did using the, the July test year, July 23, you know, where half of that, where half of that rate increase was, was the financing for, for Wolcott and other large project or two. Oh yeah. Um, good. Well, those um, are real. Yeah. But you know, where are where that's not are we going to try to bake that in i mean i think it's gonna we gotta revisit yeah we'll talk about it and we'll bring yeah. we'll bring the two options at a, at a meeting our next meeting is january 15th i'm fine right. with doing it then can, can i ask a couple of questions about timing steve if we wanted to do this rate increase now two percent. It's almost performer rate. Right? Put in January fifteenth, and by March first, we probably have approval. That's kind of the time frame for this one. If yeah. we went for full rate increase, what's the timing for that? Last time it looked seems like it took like six months to get it pulled together. Yeah, what's the it time frame is from. Uh, we've had a couple that got done more recently, in, in about five five weeks at least the work was done and the, the writing was on the wall but then it took two months to get an order out of the commission so so it's it's a six or seven month process okay yeah, so if we if we decide not to do the two percent we may be looking at six months before we get a rate increase and if if, right. if we do the two percent which is and i, I kind of talk about this as performa but if we do the two percent how long do we have to wait before we go in for another rate increase you know, I don't know the answer to that. I'll have to find what? out. Yeah, because we're supposed to be going for 2%, get it right away. At the same time, we start doing the rate increase for the full year. And maybe it's four or five months from now, we put that together. And we're going for another rate increase. 
Mm-hmm. And at least we've got the 2% for the four months, five months that we're working. Yeah. But worst case, we're going for two month, 2% now. And one yeah. year from now, we're going for another 2% in the simple method. So we've got 4% basically in a year, as opposed to just waiting to do the big one, which may take us six months. Yeah, that's one way to look at it. I like cash flow. The earlier, the better. Yeah. Ken Nolan, do you know the answer to that question? If we did a two, how long would we have to wait to do a full filing? Yeah, there's nothing in the statute that talks about <clears throat> precluding you from filing for a full rate increase. All it says is you can't do the two percent until you've you've had a full rate increase in the last ten years. So, conceivably, you could file for the two percent and then three months later file yeah. for seven or eight. Nobody's done it that way, so I don't know how the commission would react, but nothing in the statute precludes that from happening. We yeah, love being first. I'm assuming they would immediately pull your 2% out of the equation that you just got. Well, yeah, the, the way that would work if you file the full case after the, you know, soon after the 2%er, is it would be baked into your embedded revenue calculation. Okay. So it would, it, it in effect would, you, you would, it would, Pull it out of the next, uh, out of that rate increase. Yeah. It'd be like any pancake rate case. Yep. The, the statute just just says for the 2%, it can't be more than 2% in a 12 month period. But it doesn't say one way or the other if having done the 2%, and then you file for 6% a couple of months later, does that, you know, is the commission going to look at that and go, well, wait? But you did the two percent, so now you got to wait twelve months. It doesn't really say that, but it's kind of silent. So, like Ken said, nobody's done it yet. Well, I have wrote down a follow up on that for me to circle back with Eli about that. Yeah, that'll be fun and interesting. Yeah. All right. So we'll have to put our heads together, Mike. Yeah. We can do that. Yeah. Okay. Anything else on the rate increase for right now? Okay. Thank you, Steve. Uh, the next agenda item is um, communications follow up on the recent uh, customer email. I don't know if there's any discussion. Yeah, I just wanted to share the team feedback and didn't know if any of you had received any additional feedback or comments from customers that we should talk about, or if you any of you had more suggestions on things we could implement to improve that, the communications. I know we have a couple things still brewing here. Beth, you want to touch on those or? Uh, yeah. Um, so a couple of things that I've talked with the office staff about that they feel would be beneficial to our customers. Um, we would have the ability to proactively not notify them via email or text messaging, you know, hey, there's a storm coming, or we could proactively um, reach out to them when there is a storm ongoing rather than just having it posted on the website uh, or having them go to Vermont outages. So we do have the capability right now in house to proactively reach out to customers via email and uh, texting. And um, we are already going to start working on uh, getting our information updated and getting it accurate and up to date as possible. So those functions are built into our meridian system now we just need yes. to implement them right yes okay so we have email addresses for all of our customers who have email not all if they've given it to us yes we but have a lot but we don't have we them do all. have quite a, we do have quite a bit self because i was trying to mute ezra um if um so we could be emailing customers proactively it seems to me it's worth doing that um yeah that, that would be an important thing to do 
And we uh, can add a note on the bill in the comments section, you know, that we're looking for customers' email addresses that we don't have to improve that customer communication. We can do either a mailing or something on the bill, get that message out. That would be that would be a good thing to do. Um, I called in today uh, when when my power went out, and this time I didn't get a live person. I got this uh, system that that asked, "Is this the right callback number? Is this you know is this the number with the address?" And then you know going through a whole bunch of steps. Um, it would be interesting to get feedback from customers, whether they prefer that to speaking to a live person. I found it a little bit frustrating because I put in, you know, it asked you to respond to something I responded, but I guess I didn't respond fast enough. And so it sent, start, sent me through the loop again. Nice. Um, Um, it also, when I called in, it, it gave me the same, you know, calling the, the triple eight number, it still said, this is Hardwick Electric. If this is to report it, you know, this press this. And if it's that press that, but you're already on the triple eight number. And I, I don't know. I, I personally don't like systems where you just keep plugging things in because you have no idea whether anybody yeah. got it um, or anything else. I mean, it was a, it was a relatively short outage. It, it didn't matter to me, but I, I, I have a feeling that that's not going to be something that people are thrilled with. Yeah, I've actually received, um, I'll say, multiple more than multiple complaints about the CRC calling in process. So that whole thing is a um, step-by-step laid out with us and CRC. We build that flow chart with them. So I think it's time that we revisit that and maybe build a new one. <clears throat> be a dumb statement, but when I'm out of electricity, as I was this morning, I don't have email. Right. <laughs> right. So the outage this morning was actually had nothing to do with Hardwick Electric. Yes, we went down, but Green Mountain Power had a fault in their system towards Marshfield that took out the whole northern loop. So the line opens up 15 seconds later, Green Mountain Power tries to close back in. It trips back out, locks out. They have a DFR in Marshfield, a digital fault recorder that this, the SCADA system gives that information to Colchester Control Center. Control Center sends it to engineering. Engineering does a calculation and says the fault's right there on this line. So then they sectionalize, turn us back on from the Belco Stow end and send a crew to go fix that fault. But it takes, you know, 30 minutes or whatever to get that all done. Then we spent the rest of the morning, once the wind came in, chasing our tails, but it was never, you know, it was five customers here, five customers there all day. We don't mind those so much. Moving along, um, did anybody have anything else they wanted to discuss about the emails? Okay. Um, so the next item is the update on the Wolcott Hydro equipment status. Uh, Mike, thank you for all of the pictures. <laughs> Yeah, so, so one thing we were, I was shocked to find out is the weight on these components of the generator actually exceed the weight ratings on our rigging and crane equipment. So we're going to have to get some stuff upgraded in there too. So that's going to be additional expense. Additional costs, yes. Any... Not huge, not huge, but I mean, it's safety and needs to be done. 
absolutely absolutely I really, I really appreciate the photo. So thank you. Whenever you do that, it's great. It just makes us a little bit more knowledgeable and yep. informed. It's great. Did anybody have any other questions about that? Then moving on, the next item is a general manager's report. Any questions or comments? So one thing just before you move to there, did you all see the email that uh, Leopard Nutmeg did their cleaning and initial initial testing after cleaning and that the generator does not require the rewind? So we're not going to have that extra cost on top. Yep. That was 200,000. Happy to hear that. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm, I was just asking if anybody has any questions or comments about the general manager's report. I mean, I noticed that, that Mike, you had followed up on, on uh, with Swanton. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And so you're gonna be speaking with the uh, community development coordinator. Yes, Opie said that there was interest there in working with us. So what I hope to do is connect uh, the staff here with the uh, individual in Swanton and maybe she can travel, Pat's already traveled and uh, get some easy, great. easy success there. That's great. Also, uh, and I don't know uh, if Ken, you want to touch on this, but VEPSA is also looking at a new staff member to perform these functions for VEPSA members as well as VEPSA. So there may be a, another route there that we can access some. I think uh, we need to have our own staff. Um, we may want that staff member working with whoever VEPSA brings in, but I think we need our own staff. Uh, we need somebody who specifically knows Hardwick and and this and our service territory. And I mean, frankly, I think we may need another person for, in terms of of still social media and customer service, customer relations stuff. Um, because I think that's that's why we exist. Otherwise, we could be Green Mountain Power. At least in my view. But let's see what let's see how things play out with uh with, with the townsperson. Were there any other questions or comments about the general manager's report? Do we have any safety um, issues with know, these guys who are putting the fiber up on our poles that we're having trouble with or other people have already? Yes, actually since I um since i communicated that stuff to you they actually or maybe it was the same day they were pulling fiber in WEC service territory and broke two poles that they hadn't anchored so yes there's absolutely safety issues and system reliability issues where they're you know uh putting the integrity of our power lines at risk Yo -yo. So how, how long will it take to kind of smooth things out, you know, sort of resolve it? Well, we shut them down and, get them back and had a big meeting here Friday morning. And, you know, the guys that were here Friday morning were not the guys who are out in the field doing things wrong, but they are the guys in the position to correct it. And everybody, I think there was seven people here and they all committed, you know, wholeheartedly to get things straightened out. And the one thing they asked as a takeaway was, well, can we leave our cheaters on and things as they are now and circle back later? And I said, absolutely not. You need to go fix what you did wrong before you go do anything else. So yeah. that isn't what they wanted to hear, but they understood. And that's where we're going to start, you know, start anew. So that's what we got to all be ready for to hear. And Eric, it's good. You're just sitting in here to, there may be some community flack out there, but we're yes. holding up, you know, this new world. 
but there's no arguing with it. You got to do it. It's got to be done right. Yeah. And um, in your manager's report, you mentioned, you also gave us a head, heads up on Representative Sims about AMI. And um, I think I just wanted to confirm my understanding of where we are on AMI is we are eager to do AMI when it makes sense from a cost benefit standpoint so that in our view, it makes sense for our rate payers. The last shot we had at it, it was just gonna put rate pressure on, on our rate payers at a time when we didn't feel that that was a, a smart move. And that, you know, we're not, we're not Luddites. We're not saying AMI is not something we want. We want it, we envision it being part of our world. We just need to find a way to do it without breaking the bank. Is that fair? I mean, is that our is that as a as a commission? Is that where we are? And Mike, are you yeah. comfortable that's where we are? That's my understanding is that, you know, if and when you guys are presented with a better uh, business model that uh, provides a better benefit for the customers for the costs that we would incur, then you're all in. And we have not seen that. Right. And I think that's right. And I and yeah. I think that's, you know, and I think that's doing our job because our ratepayers in particular, um, you know, really are not they're not capable of and they're not comfortable with nice to have features that cause their electric bills to go up i mean that's i think we're interpreting that that's what our ratepayers expect us to be doing oh we don't have that many and we don't have a lot of people who you know need electricity at night or at off hours and strange times yeah, in other words, the people who would take advantage of a lot of the features enabled by AMI would be our higher income households, not our, yeah. not yeah. not representative of our majority. So it might be the slippery slope there is we'd be sort of charging everybody more to benefit a very short list of people who are typically more affluent. Did if you we have jump right into it now. Did you have lunch with 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 Representative Sims? You, I saw nope. the email you had offered, and I didn't know if she'd take. It. I no. offered, and she has not circled back with me. Okay. Well, we don't know how much she knows about this. She may not know a lot. And she may know a great deal. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I didn't just wanted you aware in case she called one of you. That's all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> If I might add, I think part of the issue you're running into is Representative Sims was one of the House members that helped get VEPSA our $5 million grant. Uh, so that may be okay. causing some of her questions. That's good to know. That's good to know. Well, just all, all you got to tell her, Ken, is that we just want, we because of our topography here and the cost of implementing the way we're dispersed, we just need a larger portion of the five million. <laughs> we can get it over the hump. Um. Okay. Anything else on the general manager's report? That takes us to the financial statements and the update on the Wolkett expenses, FEMA process, and a bond or bank loan. Um, so I had a meeting, or they did a Zoom thing last week on the Vermont Bond Bank, and they have a total of $15 million that they are going to have available to disperse. If they have more applications than they have money, then they have a formula that they, that they will distribute it. Our expenses for the Walcott Hydro are running about a million. So I will be, and their interest rate is 1.3%. Wow. Uh, the first first two years is uh, interest free, and then uh -huh. they start. Excuse me, I'm sorry. The first two years you pay interest only, and then you start amortizing in amorti amortization in the third year. You only draw down as needed, and you have to provide proof that 
and affirmation that it's for FEMA funding, so we have to provide them the FEMA information, and then as we get reimbursements from FEMA, then we will repay the loan. So at 1.3%, um, I will be putting in HED's application. It has to be in uh, January 9th, 10th. They expect the approvals to be done end of January and money to be going out in February. So that's and what's the term? What's the term of the loan? It's it, I'm sorry. It's seven years. The first two years are interest only. And it's 1.3% interest 1 .3 rate for seven years with five years of amortization. The, the last and there's no years. penalty to pay it off early so that as the FEMA funds come in, we can it's expected to pay off the loan. All right, Beth, we're counting on you. That's a whole Sir? lot better than plan B. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm certainly going to do everything I can to get our name in there in the in the funds that we need. Um, and as far as uh, if you don't have any more questions on that, I'm going to pursue that. And then I was going to give you an update on FEMA. So it's slow. Um, I'm still working on getting our funding back from December, and actually, the federal FEMA has approved all of our. Uh, all the monies that we've turned in it's the vermont fema that has to approve it as well and there's some little things that we still have to do to get that approved through them so i'm working through that as well um the fema agent who's working with us on the july flooding is working with me and we're trying to submit uh the dollars just as soon as we know what they are either when they're paid or when we have like a purchase order out there but it still has to go through the whole process of fema has to approve it then the vermont has to approve it so it's still a long process but um we're staying on top of it um getting it out there just as soon as we can uh, submit the costs and so the <laughs> does the equation stand true beth as the christmas storm that if we spend a dollar, the most FEMA is going to reimburse us is 75 cents. FEMA 75% and the state is 12 and a half cent, 12 and a half percent. Okay. But the state has to give their final stamp of approval before we can even get the federal funds. Sorry, I had I had people on mute. I that's uh, if my math was right. So that leaves us with twelve and a half percent that we have to cover out of our own funds. Yes. That's not too bad. Now the funds that we spent to actually do like our distribution lines restoration, that has already been spent. So that has already been funded but we will get reimbursed right it's the wool cut that not all the funds have been spent yet and we're getting purchase orders out there for it do we have to use the money that we get from fema that's a reimbursement of what we spent already to repay the the loan if we're not borrow or only the fema funds for what we borrowed for the loan bonds, the bond, the loan, excuse me, ah, the loan requirement is that the FEMA funds that we get will go towards repayment of the loan. But FEMA, that's not a FEMA requirement. It's the bond bank. No, no, I understand that. I understand that. What I'm asking is there are two kinds of FEMA money. There's FEMA, well, it's all FEMA, re re FEMA is reimbursing us. But there's some money that we have that we've spent that we haven't borrowed anything from for. Right. We're not borrowing from from the bond but from the Vermont Bond Bank for. If 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 call it column A and column B. So column A is what we funded out of existing revenues. Column B is what we're going to need to borrow for. If we get FEMA money, that's a re when we get the money, 
does it say it's for this versus it's for that that they're reimbursing us so that we if we get money it's such a good interest rate is <laughs> that, that it, it, <laughs> it, it 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 makes sense given current inflation and interest rates to be borrowing i don't know how to put it All to borrow it. that money as long as possible so that to the extent that we're getting a FEMA reimbursement that's associated with something that we didn't borrow for. My question is, do we have to use that money because it's money from FEMA to repay the loan or it's only what we borrowed? It's only for the items that we borrowed for. It's only the items that we borrowed for because part of the loan application means we have to show the exact FEMA documents that we are requesting money for. So then when we get the money for those projects, then that has to go back to pay the loan. And so it's we're distinguishing project. between, so we're, we, we won't include what we've already spent. Correct. Okay, great. Anything else on the financial statements or that? Then I think the next item, um, I would like to move that we go into executive session with Ken Nolan to discuss a uh, possible legal matter, the premature disclosure of which would prejudice the interests of Hardwick Electric Department. Um, and Steve, if you're not needed for this, then we need you to drop off the call. Steve is not needed for this. Can Mike, can you bounce him yeah, from the call I'm, since I'm he's looking. not I responding? Think, I think I can. Right here, yeah. Uh, and we need a second on the motion. I I can. <clears throat> okay, so, so as soon as we can get rid of the recording now, It is 5.51 p.m. and we are out of executive session. No action was taken. Is there any other business to discuss this evening? So, Mike, I was scheduled for Thursday night meeting with the Hardwick Electric, and I, I assume you saw my email. I can't do it. I did, yeah. So, meeting Matt, with Matt, Matt can't attend the select board meeting Thursday night. If one of you can, great. If not, I'll go. And then put me on to replace somebody later. And uh, Casey at the town is asking for next year's schedule. And I was just going to keep the rotation the same, put miles in for Vince and keep the same rotation. Great. So I'm not hearing anybody jump on Thursday, so I'll go. <laughs> That's fine. No, I would like no surgery Thursday, so I'm not No going. problem. I'll go. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Okay, well, uh, there's no other business. Is there a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second. Second. We are adjourned, and thank you, Ken. Thanks, Ken. Good night. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Beth. Nice.